Well, thanks, Paul, for that uh, gracious introduction. And uh, it's actually my first trip, uh, my first visit to the Aero Club lunch. And uh, after 40 years, you would have thought I would have made it here at least one time. Um, and it, uh, there's so many friends and familiar faces. Uh, but our paths just never crossed at this particular venue. But, uh, um, you know, and it wasn't anything deliberate on, on my part. It's just that uh, somebody told me one time that you lose your outside the Beltway membership card if you attend one of these things. So, so that's my, uh, my story. But uh, I'm also thrilled to be here to see Carl receive the Incan Trophy. Um, I can't think of, uh, of a better example, uh, an epitome of a public servant, and that's uh, Carl Burleson. Of course, he's passionate about aviation. Uh, we at the FAA are better because of him, and the American public has benefited greatly from Carl's dedication uh, and his leadership. It's a great privilege to work with him. Uh, congratulations, Carl. Uh, and we were, we were talking before uh, the luncheon here about whether Kathy was going to allow him as in Christmas story with the leg lamp to display the, uh, his major award with appropriate up lighting in their uh, picture window in front of their, in front of their house. But, uh, and I can also see that you married up just like I did. But uh, seriously, it's hard not to be passionate about an, an industry that makes our world smaller. Um, aviation fundamentally redefines geographic boundaries, it provides tremendous economic opportunities, and it connects people and cultures in ways that were unimaginable not too long ago. And I know the people in this room, regardless of our differences in perspectives and experiences, share a common bond, and that's a love for aviation. We also share a commitment to enhancing the benefits that aviation provides for our citizens today, as well as the promise that it holds to connect the world in the decades ahead. And that's why I'm here, because I love aviation and I love working with people. It's a privilege to lead, and uh, I've discovered great people at the FAA. As you might imagine, I'm getting a lot of advice right now about how to run the place. <laughs> now, some of that advice has been more helpful than others, uh, but seriously, it's already been a tremendously rewarding adventure. Now, I know you're probably asking yourself, why are you doing this, Steve? Why FA Administrator? Several people asked me the same question over the last few months as I was going through the confirmation process. One of those people was my wife, who <laughs> questioned my sanity at several points along the way. And the FA was actually an unplanned diversion on our family's flight plan. I was looking for what the next thing would be after my military and airline career and my wife and I actually thought it would be retirement, but that turned out not to be the case. When Secretary Chow asked me uh, if uh, I'd consider leading the FAA, I said I'd be interested in talking to her about it. You know, FAA administrator is not something that you aspire to or even contemplate. But if I could help make a difference, I could think of no better way to serve my country uh, and, uh, and in a way that also allows me to indulge my passion for flying and my four decades of experience in the industry. So I'm both honored and humbled uh, to be here and grateful that I have the chance to lead the agency at this historic and challenging time. But challenges create opportunities, don't they? We can't forget that. So as you've heard, and again, thanks for your kind words, Paul, uh, my experience includes flying F-15 fighters in the Air Force and 27 years at Delta. The Delta includes a line pilot for the first nine years of my career, qualifying on all those airplanes that you heard about. The last 12 years I served as the Senior Vice President of Flight Operations. Now, during a visit to an aviation high school last month, one of the students asked me my favorite plane to fly during my airline career. And as anyone who's flown, that's, that's a tough question to, add, to answer. Um, I told him that I liked, I liked them all, but my favorite big jet is the 757. But I was also fond of the 727, which is where I started out as a flight engineer. And being a flight engineer is a pretty interesting experience. Um, even though I was qualified as a fighter pilot, very highly trained tactical aviator, the most difficult training program 
I ever completed was as a flight engineer trainee at the seven, in the 727 at Delta. On that airplane, the flight engineer was the system integrator, and you had to really have a detailed understanding of every system on the aircraft. Sitting down in front of that big engineer panel was something very foreign for a single-seat fighter pilot. Early in training, staring at the banks of indicator lights, the, these amber indicator lights in front of you, uh, figuring out what, how you were going to handle an emergency. If a student hesitated, the instructors would joke that you were sitting there getting a suntan. But it was a great way to learn about airline operations. The way the cockpit was laid out, the flight engineer was always working with the flight attendants, working customer service issues, working with the captain on uh, how to run the cockpit, how to work, run checklists, getting valuable insight into how to make decisions in the uh, airline environment. Now, as Senior Vice President of Flight Operations, as you've heard, I was responsible for the safety and operational performance of the company's global flight operations, more than a million flights a year on six continents, as well as pilot training crew resources, scheduling, and regulatory compliance. Now, that job made me understand this simple fact. Regardless of change, increasing complexity, or competition, safety always has to remain the focus and bedrock of our industry. So now three months into my job here at the FAA, let me share a few observations. And I'll start out by saying I feel a little bit like that new hire 727 engineer. A lot of experience, but a completely new environment and a lot to learn. Not surprisingly, I've been in a lot of discussions a lot of conversations about the Boeing 737 MAX. On behalf of everyone at the FAA, <clears throat> FAA, I would like to once again extend our deepest sympathy and condolences to the families of the victims of the Ethiopian Airlines and Lion Air accidents. Many nations, including the United States, had citizens on those flights. Deputy Administrator Dan Elwell and I have met with the family members and friends of those on board. Each time we meet, we see their pain, their loss, and it reaffirms the seriousness with which we must approach safety every single day. We want our citizens and our own families to have confidence in the aviation system when they travel. These accidents should not have happened. That's why we as regulators, operators, manufacturers, the entire aviation ecosystem work so hard in our jobs each and every day. I'll tell you this, and if you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember it. I'm absolutely committed to honoring the memory of those who lost their lives by working tirelessly each and every day of my tenure to ensure the highest possible margin of safety in the global aviation system. We will never rest. We can always find ways to improve. We can always do better. Safety is a journey, not a destination, and it's a journey that we undertake each and every day with humility and a focus on continuous improvement. And I've said this before, but we'll continue to repeat it. The FAA's return to service decision for the MAX will be based solely on our assessment of the sufficiency of Boeing's proposed software updates and pilot training that addresses the known issues for grounding the aircraft. We are not delegating anything in this process. When we finally take the decision to return this aircraft to service, it will be the most scrutinized aircraft in history. It will also be one of the safest machines to ever take to the sky. I'm not going to sign off on the aircraft until I fly it myself, and I'm satisfied that I would put my own family on it without a second thought. As both Dan and I have said, we welcome scrutiny, and we welcome the feedback on how we can improve our processes. Several independent reviews have been undertaken on the MAX, and on the FAA's certification and delegation processes. The first of these to be completed uh, was one that we, com that we commissioned, asking nine other authorities to join us in the Joint Authorities Technical Review, or JATR, 
to assess the Boeing 737 MAX flight control system certification. Never before have 10 authorities come together to conduct a review of this sort. And I want to emphasize that we invited this probing review by our peer regulators. That's the FAA at its best. We welcome the JATA's recommendations, and I appreciate their thorough review and their hard work. We also created a Technical Advisory Board, or TAB, as you've probably seen it referenced, made up of FAA chief scientists and experts from the U.S. Air Force, Volpe National Transportation System Center, and NASA. The TAB's job is to conduct an independent review of the proposed integrated flight control system, training, and continued operational safety determination for the MAX. The TAB recently briefed members of Congress and myself on their progress and the status of Boeing's and the FAA's response to the return to service action items. Our work also continues on the Department of Transportation's IG audit of the 737 MAX, as well as congressional investigations. And we welcome the recent recommendations by the National Transportation Safety Board. And finally, we're awaiting a report from the Secretary's Special Committee on Aircraft Certification this Blue Ribbon Panel was established earlier this year to advise and provide recommendations to the Department on policy level topics related to certification across the manufacturer spectrum. Now, I'm here to tell you that willingness to accept critique is a sign of humility and transparency. It's also a strength. I've seen this firsthand as I've met our regulatory counterparts around the world. They appreciate and they value U.S. leadership. They understand that by working together, we will all be better and be able to raise the bar on global aviation safety. Now, going forward beyond the MAX, some key themes are emerging regarding aircraft certification processes, not only in the U.S., but around the world. I'm committed to addressing each of these issues, and they include moving toward a more holistic versus transactional item by line item approach to aircraft certification, integrating human factors considerations more effectively throughout the design process as aircraft become more automated and systems become more complex, and finally ensuring coordinated and flexible information and data flow during the oversight process. And while attention has been rightfully focused on the 737 MAX, we're also focused at the agency on integrating innovative new entrants into the national airspace. If you've been watching your FAA Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram feeds recently, and I'm not a social media guy, so hopefully you've been watching them, you've certainly seen the boom in the unmanned aircraft and commercial space sectors. We've already registered about a million and a half small drones about 400,000 of which are for commercial purposes. And we've approved two Part 135 drone operations. As a point of reference for how fast this industry is moving, the FAA has been certifying manned aircraft for 92 years. And after only four years of registering drones, we've already got four times as many unmanned systems on the books. UPS and FedEx are actively participating in trials to speed up the delivery of small packages and are working on type certificates for small autonomous drones. Innovators up in Alaska are looking to do the same with much larger vehicles. We're learning a great deal about the innovative ways that drones can help society through our innovation pilot program, which Secretary Chow launched about two years ago. Our strategy of operations first is allowing us to use the existing regulatory regime which helps us ensure that innovation can drive forward. Saying this another way, over the last three years, we've shifted from writing rules to getting machines in the air and using the lessons learned from the operations approval process to write better rules. Our vision is to integrate rather than segregate unmanned systems into the national airspace system. Now through the integration pilot program, you probably know we're partnering with nine state, local, and tribal governments and industry to inform UAS regulations, policy, and guidance 
by learning from practical applications. Perhaps more importantly, these efforts have become the match that's lighting a creative fire in the industry for what this novel new form of transportation might achieve. Flying taxis, otherwise known as urban air mobility, are on the horizon and chomping at the bit to begin airspace testing. According to the FAUAS team, we're currently engaged with the builders of more than 15 electric ver vertical takeoff and landing aircraft projects. Airframers are eyeing a potential renaissance in supersonic civil aircraft, something I never thought I would see during my career. And startup civil space companies are looking to connect New York and Shanghai in less than 40 minutes. Commercial space launch activity has ramped up tenfold in the last few years. Just yesterday, we saw a successful FAA licensed and certified commercial space launch, which deployed 60 communication satellites to low Earth orbit. On the small aircraft end of the spectrum, life-saving automation technologies are coming to smaller and smaller aircraft. Late last month, one of our prominent avionics manufacturers unveiled a new product development that highlights the promise. In a nutshell, if the pilot of a small plane equipped with this technology becomes incapacitated, the passengers now have a chance. They push a button on the panel and the automation takes over and lands the plane at the nearest suitable airport. Imagine that. So all this is exciting. As the regulator, we must find ways to operate ahead of the rate of change in the industry. This will require us to improve, con to improve continuously and avoid bureaucratic inertia. We have to leverage our collective experience without allowing the attitude of, well, we've always done it that way, to be an obstacle. So how do we reconcile the tension between incredibly bright and innovative minds and fast-moving technologies with a reinvigorated regulatory agency that wants and needs innovation, but at the same time maintains safety as its North Star? Well, we do it by sticking to our core values of safety through integrity, innovation, and people. And I see our strategy coalescing around four themes. Those are big data, just culture, global leadership, and people. Now, on the data front, we've got to continue leaning into our role as a data-driven, risk-based decision-making oversight organization that prioritizes safety above all else. We do that by breaking down silos between organizations and implementing safety management systems supported by compliance programs. We look at the aviation ecosystem as a whole, including how all the parts interact. Aircraft, pilots, engineers, flight attendants, technicians, mechanics, dispatchers, air traffic controllers, everyone and everything in the operating environment. In addition to the technical work that we have ahead of us for truly integrated data, a key enabler of a data-driven safety organization is a healthy reporting culture. A good safety culture produces the data that you need to figure out what's really happening. If we know about safety risks and know where the threats are and how errors are occurring, we can mitigate the risks and fix the processes that led to those errors. A good safety culture demands that we infuse the safety data into all of our processes from top to bottom in a continuous loop. To be successful, a safety organization relies on a just culture that places great value on frontline employees and those involved in the operation, raising and reporting safety concerns in a timely, systematic way without fearing retaliation. That requires that a just culture starts at the top. It's something leadership has to nurture and support at every level. Employees have to see the results, see what the data is showing, how the agency or the company is using analysis tools to identify risks and errors and put actions in place to mitigate them. Now, from my experience as an operations leader in an airline, safety management systems allowed us to find out about issues and put preventive measures in place before an accident or incident occurs. Of course, there were certain actions 
that were out of bounds. For example, if someone intentionally violated a rule. That doesn't actually happen very often. If someone makes an honest mistake, we would put corrective actions in place to make sure that we address the issues systemically. Sometimes it might involve retraining a crew, but in those cases where the data indicated a trend, the corrective actions often involve modifications to processes, procedures, policies, or training. And when you think about how far aviation has come in a little more than a century, from the barnstorming days to a safety record that's the envy of all modes of transportation, it's hard to argue the value of these safety tools and the importance of the FAA's leadership. Today, the U.S. aviation system is the safest, most dynamic, and innovative in the world. And we have the numbers to prove it. This is largely due to the collaborative approaches to safety championed by the FAA and by many people in this room. Last Friday, I spent some time out, out at MITRE with the uh, ASIAS team, and if you don't know what ASIAS is, it stands for Aviation Safety Information and Sharing. And it's one of the crown jewels of the aviation safety system in the United States. And it's also unique in the world. This is an example of the kind of collaboration, leadership, and safety innovation we can use to lead the global aviation safety system to even higher levels of performance. By working with and mentoring other authorities around the world, we will work to ensure that we meet the public's expectations of the highest possible levels of safety globally, even in areas we don't regulate directly. Over the years, if you think about it, the FAA has done more than any other organization around the world to promote and develop global aviation safety. We have an opportunity to do even more, and we will do more. Think about why you're here. At our core, we're all about working together to increase the margin of safety, because without that, we have nothing. Now, maintaining the highest levels of safety while adapting to technological advancements is a key part of that success for all of us here and around the world. Without safety as a foundation, we can't have a vibrant aviation industry in any country, much less between countries. And as it is, our international air transportation network is a tightly woven fabric that's dependent on all of us making safety our core value. And that brings me to my final point, people. We live in an exciting time in aviation with new emerging technologies and capabilities. I've told some that this might be the most exciting time in our business since the introduction of the jet engine, or maybe all, all the way back to the DC-3. But at its core, a huge operations and regulatory agency like the FAA is made up of people. People who are driven to serve, people with families, hopes, dreams, and aspirations, people who want satisfying and fulfilling careers. I have the utmost respect for the job that they do every day, making sure our skies are safe and that the operation of the system is as efficient and serves the public as well as it possibly can. It's time to show that next generation of aviation leaders what incredible opportunities lie ahead for them in our field, both personally and professionally. It's the people who will innovate and collaborate to take us to the next level of safety, operational excellence, and opportunity. You know, aviation's hard lessons and the industry's hard work have paved the way to creating a global aviation system with an enviable safety record. But as I said earlier, safety is a journey, not a destination. And we need to remember that what we have done in the past and what we're doing now will not be good enough in the future. We must build on the lessons learned, and we must never allow ourselves to become complacent. Those lessons teach us that in order to prevent the next accident from happening, we have to look at the overall aviation system and how all the pieces interact. If we don't do this and instead focus on a single factor, we will miss the opportunities to improve our margin of safety. That will require truly integrated data enterprise-wide. When our data and our organizations are kept in silos, 
we may miss information that could provide an opportunity to make important safety decisions that will improve processes or even prevent accidents entirely. We have to be constantly learning from each other, regulator and those we regulate, to help each other improve. That's the only way the system is going to get better. We at the FAA are prepared to take the lead in this new phase of system safety, a task that we approach with a spirit of humility and openness. That's a strength that we have as a country. We will lead. We have to. So thanks again for your hospitality and your time today. Uh, I look forward to getting to know uh, those of you I don't have not had the opportunity to work with much better. And uh, it's great to be with you, even if we are inside the Beltway. Thank you. Thank you.